You know, yeah. I, I think we've all seen at least one sci-fi movie where they talk about this quantum internet of the future, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I have a feeling that most of us, like myself, we kind of glaze over those details. Right. Like, yeah, cool. But I don't actually understand how any of that works. Yeah. Well, today we are diving into a research paper that gets us one step closer to that. Okay. It's called an operating system for executing applications on quantum network nodes. Mm. Now, I know that title sounds... Yeah, it's a mouthful. A little dry, yeah. right? But trust me, this is much more exciting than that title might suggest. It is. It really is. I mean, what's so fascinating about this is that it's moving beyond just building these quantum networks, you know, in the lab. Right. It's talking about actually using them. And this paper is all about a new operating system. Okay. And you can think of an operating system just like the software foundation right. that lets us run programs Got it. on these quantum networks. Yes. Okay, so it's like it's like the bridge between this like crazy mind bending world of quantum mechanics. Exactly. And something that like programmers can actually use. Exactly. That's a huge hurdle. Yeah. That's been holding back the development of practical quantum applications. So before we get into this new system. Sure. Let's make sure everyone's on the same page here. Okay. When we say quantum network, yeah. what are we talking about? Yeah. How is it different from like the internet that we use every day? You can imagine like the early days of computers, you know, where you had these standalone machines, uh, each doing their own thing. Right. Then came the internet. Yeah. And suddenly we could connect them, we could share information, and it just revolutionized everything. Yeah. Quantum networks aim to do the same thing for quantum computers. Okay. I see that parallel. But instead of bits traveling across wires, right. we have uh, entangled quibits. Precisely. Okay. And those entangled quibits unlock possibilities that are just impossible with classical bits. Think secure communication that's virtually unhackable, you right. know? Why? Distributed quantum computing power that could dwarf anything we have today. Yeah. Even sensors with unimaginable precision. Okay. I can see why people are excited about this. Yeah. But I have to ask... Haven't we already built quantum networks? Like, what makes this research paper so groundbreaking? Well, you're right. We have seen quantum networks built, you know, in a laboratory setting. Right. But actually running applications on them. Yeah. That was a completely different story. Yeah. It was like trying to code by, like, manually flipping switches uh -huh. and rewiring circuits. A nightmare even for the most hardcore quantum physicist. Yeah, that sounds rough. Yeah. I can see how that would limit progress. Exactly. Yeah. So each experiment had to be, like, meticulously hard-coded. Right. And required dope knowledge of both the specific hardware and the quantum physics behind it. Right. This new operating system, which they call QNODE OS, okay. changes the game completely. Okay, so QNODE OS is the hero of our story here. I think so. Tell me more about what makes it so special. So one of the biggest breakthroughs is that QNODE OS provides what's called hardware abstraction. Okay. And what that means is that it allows programmers to write code. Yeah. Without needing to understand all the intricate details yep. of the underlying quantum devices. So it's like how I can use my computer yeah. without knowing exactly how the processor works. Precisely. Like just tell it what to do and it figures out the rest. Exactly. And this is critical for making quantum computing accessible to a much wider range of developers. Right. It also enables something called interactive execution. Okay. Which means that programs can actually communicate with each other. Okay. And respond to inputs in real time. Got it. Which is essential for any kind of real world application. That makes sense. I mean, think about how we use the internet today. Yeah. Like constant back and forth communication. Right. So a quantum internet would need that same capability. Absolutely. But let's be honest here. Sure. Quantum computers are still pretty rare. Right. And very expensive. For sure. So how does QNODE OS address that? That's where the third key feature comes in. Oh. Okay. Multitasking. Okay. QNODE OS can run multiple quantum programs simultaneously mm. on the same hardware. Wow. And this maximizes the use of these limited and valuable quantum resources. So efficiency. I'm sensing a theme here. Absolutely. Efficiency is key. So this QNODE OS sounds incredible on paper. It does. But did they actually build it? They did, and not just in theory. They tested QNODE OS on actual quantum hardware. Okay. Now things are getting really interesting. Tell me about their testing setup. Yeah, so they actually tested it on two different types of quantum hardware, which is really important for showing that this operating system isn't limited to just one specific type of quantum computer. Okay. 
The first one they used was using nitrogen vacancy centers, or NV centers for short. NV centers, uh, those are those like tiny imperfections in diamonds right. that can act as quibits. Right. That's right. And the second type of hardware they used was trapped ions. Okay. Essentially, individual atoms held in place by electromagnetic fields. Got it. Both of these are leading contenders in the race to build practical quantum computers. So by uh, testing QNode EOS on these two completely different platforms, yeah. they're demonstrating that it could potentially work on any type of quantum computer. Right. That's a huge step towards building like a truly universal quantum internet. Exactly. It's like creating a universal language that all quantum computers can understand. Okay. Now, I know we've thrown around a lot of terms like hardware abstraction and interactive execution. Right. But I think it would be helpful to actually walk through how QNODIOS works in practice. Yeah. Let's get down to the nuts and bolts here. Okay. What happens when, like, a programmer wants to run a program on this quantum network? Well, imagine you're a programmer and you've written a program using a language specifically designed for quantum networks. Okay. This program gets submitted to the Classical Network Processing Unit, or CNPU. CNPU. Okay, so I'm guessing that handles all the classical computing side of things. Got it. The CNPU acts like a project manager. You know, I... it breaks down your program into smaller chunks called subroutines. Right. Figures out which parts need to be run on a quantum computer, huh? which parts can be handled by a classical computer, and then sends these subroutines to the Quantum Network Processing Unit. Okay. Or QNPU. So the QNPU is the one that actually interacts with the quantum hardware. Exactly. But here's the thing. Oh, okay. The QNPU itself is kind of like a hybrid machine. Okay. It has a classical processor for handling those classical subroutines. Right. But it also controls the quantum hardware for those tasks that require the power of quibits. Okay. I'm starting to see how all the pieces fit together. Yeah. But we talked earlier about QNODS being able to run multiple programs at the same time. Right. How does that work? That's a good question. Like, doesn't that get messy with both classical and quantum computations happening at the same time? That's where the QMPU's secret weapon comes in. Okay. The scheduler. Okay. The scheduler is like an air traffic controller, you know, yeah. constantly juggling tasks, making sure everything runs smoothly and efficiently. I like it. It prioritizes tasks, minimizes downtime, ah. and makes sure that the quantum hardware is always being used to its fullest. So it's optimizing for both speed. Right and the use of those precious quantum resources. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. But quantum computers are still notoriously finicky. Oh, yeah, they are. How did QNODE OS handle the real-world challenges of things like qubit decoherence and communication delays? That's a great question, and that's really where the testing comes in. You know, remember those two types of quantum hardware they used? Yeah. Well, they didn't just run, like, simple programs on them. What they specifically designed experiments to push QNODE OS to its limits. Okay, give me an example. What kind of challenges did they throw at it? One of the key tests was something called a delegated computation task. Oh. Imagine you want to use, like, a really powerful quantum computer in the cloud okay. to perform a complex calculation but you don't want to reveal the details of what you're calculating. Oh, okay. That's well, delegated computation. Ah, uh, so it's all about privacy and security. Exactly. Like being able to outsource your quantum homework. Yeah. But without showing anyone the actual problems. Exactly. And they successfully demonstrated this on their QNODE OS testbed. Wow. A client node sent instructions to a server node. The server performed the quantum computation without knowing what it was actually calculating. Okay. And then sent the results back to the client. That's incredible. They basically show that you can perform blind quantum calculations. Yeah. Which has huge implications for things like secure cloud computing. Huge. Did they test anything else? What about the multitasking capabilities? Well, they ran a delegated computation task and a separate task at the same time. Hold on. They were multitasking on a quantum computer. On the same hardware. That's seriously impressive. Yeah, it is. And yeah. they did all this while dealing with the real world imperfections of these early quantum devices. Mm. Think about it. They had to manage communication between nodes, account for quibit decoherence, yeah. make sure everything stayed synchronized, all while running multiple complex programs. Okay, that's mind-blowing. Yeah. So they proved that QNOD OS can handle secure computation, yeah. multitask, yeah. and deal with like the messy realities of quantum hardware. Exactly. It's a huge leap forward in making 
quantum networks more than just a laboratory curiosity. Yeah. They're starting to look like something we could actually use. This is all very exciting. It is. But I'm also curious about how they actually measured the performance of QNode EOS. Right. Like what metrics did they use to show that it was actually working as intended? Well, in the world of quantum computing, one of the key metrics is something called fidelity. Okay. And it's essentially a measure of how closely the results of a quantum computation match what we theoretically expect. Yep. The higher the fidelity, the more accurate the computation. So a fidelity of 100% would mean that the quantum computer is performing perfectly like no errors. Exactly. But that's incredibly difficult to achieve in the real world. Yeah, of course. Quantum systems are incredibly sensitive to noise and interference. Right. Think of it like trying to balance a pencil on its tip. Okay. Any tiny vibration is going to cause it to topple over. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah. So where did QNODE OS land on that fidelity scale? Well, in their experiments, they were able to achieve fidelities consistently above 70%. Wow. Which is really impressive, especially considering this is all running on very early quantum hardware. 70%. That might not sound like a lot in like the classical world, but in the quantum realm, that's a big deal, right? Absolutely. Remember, we're still in the very early stages of quantum computing. Yeah. Even achieving these fidelities is a testament to how far the technology has come. Right. And as the hardware improves, you know, we can expect those fidelities to get even higher. So this research is clearly a big step forward for quantum networking. It is. But it also raises a lot of questions. You know, we've touched on, like, the potential benefits. Right. But what about the potential risks? Yeah. I mean, we've seen how the Internet you know, it has kind of created its own set of problems. Right. Should we be concerned about the potential downsides of a quantum internet? I mean, it's definitely something we need to be thinking about. Yeah. You know, any powerful technology That's... can be used for both good and bad. Of course. And the quantum internet is no exception. Okay, so let's talk about those concerns. Yeah. What are some of the things that kind of worry you? Well, one of the biggest ones, as we mentioned earlier, is security. Okay. Quantum communication promises unbreakable encryption, which is amazing for protecting sensitive information. Yeah. But what if that same technology falls into the wrong hands? Right. You know, it could be used to create like impenetrable criminal networks. Right. Or disrupt critical infrastructure. Yeah. That's a chilling thought. It is. And it's not just about like malicious actors, right? Right. What about governments or corporations using quantum enhanced surveillance? to monitor citizens right. or control information. Yeah. These are all possibilities we need to consider. Absolutely. The potential for misuse is real. Yeah. And we need to be proactive in developing safeguards and ethical guidelines. Right. It's about finding that balance between innovation and responsibility. So it's not just about the technology itself. Right. But like how we choose to use it. Exactly. Sounds like we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. To ensure that the quantum internet benefits society as a whole and doesn't create like new problems that we're not prepared for. I agree. This isn't just a technical challenge. It's a societal one. Yeah. And we need to have open and honest conversations about the potential implications of this technology mm -hmm. and involve ethicists, policymakers and the public in shaping its development. It's a lot to think about. This this research has like opened my eyes to like a whole new world of possibilities. Yeah. Both exciting and a little bit daunting. I've, I feel the same way, but ultimately, I'm optimistic. I think that by working together, yeah. we can harness the power of quantum networks for good and create a future where this technology benefits all of humanity. I like that a future where this technology benefits all of humanity. Yeah. That's a vision worth striving for. And, you know, one thing that really struck me throughout this whole deep dive. Yeah. Is that we're not just talking about some far off science fiction anymore. No. Like this research shows that the quantum Internet is becoming a reality. It really does. And it's a call to action for all of us to start thinking critically about this technology. Yeah. Engaging in the conversation about how we want to shape the quantum future. Absolutely. It's an incredible time to be alive. It is. And witnessing this technological revolution unfold. Well said. And to our listeners, we leave you with this. What role will you play? in shaping the quantum future. Yeah. What will your contribution be? Right. Will you be a builder, a policymaker, a watchdog, or simply an informed citizen? Yeah. The future is waiting to be written. Mm -hmm. And it's up to all of us to decide what that future will look like. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey. We'll see you next time for another deep dive into the world of cutting edge research.